Today I want to talk about sump pumps. Talking about sump pumps on a permaculture channel might seem a little bit strange, but you'd be amazed at how often I work with clients and even, ironically, in our own family cabin um, around sump pumps. So a couple of things. Um, today, specifically, I'm going to be putting a new sump pump into our family cabin because uh, the old one has finally bit the dust. Now, I have gone out and bought the best sump pump on the market so that this does not happen again for a very, very long time. But I thought it would be a great opportunity to talk about why I hate sump pumps so much and specifically the lack of design that goes into modern day homes. So a lot of times when we're talking about design and permaculture and all that stuff, we have this mantra that goes something like this, water, access and structures. So basically what we're saying there is that we design the water systems on a property first, then we figure out how to get access to the property because water is a master element. Basically all elements on the property either want it or benefit from water or are damaged by water. <clears throat> and so you can think about access. Access is basically roads. Roads don't really want to be in the middle of water courses. In fact, roads want to shed water. They're kind of like roofs. Structures are the same thing. Structures don't really want to be in water courses. They want to be on dry land. Um, in addition, structures need to take into account what's going on above the surface from a water perspective, but also what's going on below the surface. Now, present day design pretty much just ignores the natural functions of an ecosystem or the ecological services. And in fact, when humanity decides that they don't like an ecological service, then they call it a liability. And so most present day design focuses around the shaping of land to concentrate and dispose of water. And they do this because it's cheaper to shape the land with massive bulldozers and earth shaping equipment, um, or it's more profitable, I should say, than, than cost effective because the cost per unit house placed into an area far outstrips the cost of earth shaping it to force function an ecosystem to function in a specific way. And so we end up with houses placed in locations that should not be there. And as a result, we end up with basements that are in water tables that are really high. And in order to accommodate for these high water tables, we put some pumps in it. Now, most people don't realize this, but a basement even though it is super thick, like walls in a basement can be six to 10 inches thick, depending on how deep they go. Basements are basically concrete boats. If you don't evacuate the water underneath the basement, one of two things can happen. Either the house will start to float or the foundation will essentially crack due to hydraulic pressure and the basement will flood. Now I have been around many, many flooded basements. I mean, we had the floods of 2013 in Calgary. Um, this cabin in particular has almost flooded at least half a dozen times. And luckily I've been around to hook up generators and pumps and all sorts of crazy solutions to stop it from actually happening. And a flooded basement can cause all sorts of problems. You can get toxic mold. You can end up having to replace the entire basement, which can be 40, 50, $100,000 to do so you end up having increased insurance premiums. <clears throat> I mean, the liabilities are just endless. If you're in the middle of designing a house, I highly recommend you consider designing a slab on grade house so you don't ever have to have a sump pump. Um, if you insist on having a basement, however, I recommend you do some significant tests on the property to see how high the water table actually gets. Because if you've got a high water table, you should either get rid of the property because if the basement is more important than the actual location, then you should find a property that will allow you to have a basement. Or you should just change the design so that you don't have to have a pump that constantly goes off. This pump that I'm sitting beside right now in the springtime literally goes off every five minutes. And it'll do that for most of the summer, finally slowing down once the ground freezes in the wintertime and the water stops coming in. And so this in permaculture is what we call a type 1 error. It's such a type one error that we actually have to have a sump pump with a battery backup. So there's actually two pumps in the hole, one in the event that the grid goes down, um, which is the battery powered one, and one that functions while the grid is up. 
However, because the flow of water is so significant in the springtime, a standard 700 amp battery only lasts between 6 and 10 hours depending on the rate of pumping, like how much water it's actually pumping out. And so we've actually had to install a generator onto the building as well in order to have a grid backup. So now we have a generator for the grid backup which will allow the pump to actually operate um, in the event of a grid outage. So we've got our own kind of island, if you will, our own grid. And then we have a backup pump in the event that the generator and the grid dies. And also the backup will also act as a secondary pump in the event that the main pump dies. So we've got one, two, three, four layers of redundancy in order to ensure that this basement doesn't flood. So as you can see, it gets a little bit crazy when you start having to add all of these layers of redundancy and very expensive I should add to uh, put all of these layers in. So this pump system that I just bought which I'm going to show you here in a second was actually thousand dollars. Now if you have a plumber install it instead of yourself that's probably going to add another five six hundred dollars. So you're looking at a sixteen hundred dollar investment every five to ten years to replace this pump. The generator outside is around ten thousand dollars and then you've got to manage all the water that comes out of the ground. Um, once you bring it to the surface, you've got to figure out where you're going to put it all. Not to mention, you're actually trying to drain the subsoils or the groundwater, which is almost an impossible task to do. So hopefully you're getting the sense as to why I'm not a big fan of sump pumps and why you should do a lot of due diligence before you make that decision to build a basement on a place with high water table. Now, this house was built in a place that didn't look like it had high water tables. And after three or four years of increased rainfall, which apparently is pretty normal around here, we get these cyclical um, rain systems. So we'll get really wet five years and then it'll be really dry for five years sort of thing. I'm not sure what the exact cycle is. So when, they, when this house was built, the groundwater table was pretty low and it didn't look like some pump was going to be needed. Um, and so it's good to go talk to the locals and find out information about what's going on with the ground table and if it seasonally goes up and down. That's the first thing. The second thing to consider is that if the locals don't know anything about the groundwater, you can actually do test pits around the house and you can do soil structure tests and look at the physical characteristics of the soils and subsoils. And there's actually this thing called soil modeling that you can not, not model as in supermodel, but MOT, MOTL, M-O-T. Um, and it'll tell you whether there's seasonal inundation of groundwater. So there's lots of little patterns that you can look for to tell you whether or not you're going to have seasonal inundation of water. And that should give you clues with regards to how you build your septic system, whether or not you build a basement, um, and anything else related to water infrastructure or water um, opportunities and liabilities on the property. Lastly, if you are insistent on building a basement, the only real basements that make sense to me, uh, e even in areas with high groundwater tables, are walkouts. And the reason that I really like walkout basements, if you're going to build a basement, is because a walkout basement has what we call relief, which basically means that the foundation has the ability to evacuate the water around it without the use of a pump. Pumps are mechanical, they're going to fail. Generators are mechanical, they're going to fail. Grids also have lots of moving parts and eventually they will fail as well, even if it's just for a short period of time. And so wherever possible, you want to build your infrastructure around things that are not going to fail. In other words, solid state. So when we put weeping tile, which is a type of drainage pipe around the foundation of a building, it has no moving parts. It just collects water and it evacuates it. So if you're going to end up putting in a walkout basement that has weeping tile and it's going to be evacuating water around your foundation, then try and find some functions that you can use that water for. Put it to productive use. Put it into a rain garden. Put it into a pond. Don't just let it go. Water is one of the most valuable resources that we have on this planet. It allows us to grow plants, it allows us to sequester carbon, it allows us to grow our own food, fiber, fuel, etc, etc, etc. So don't waste the water. Um, so now I'm going to show you this pump and why it's pretty awesome, um, as some pumps go, and how it works, and then I'm going to go and install it. Um, I'm not going to show you the installation, it's pretty standard, but I just wanted to show you the specific sump pump. So if you're looking for a sump pump, something that's bulletproof, pretty much the best on the market, this is the one. 
Um, I've pretty much been told by um, insurance companies as well as the local plumbing outfit that I bought it from that if you tell your insurance company you have one of these systems in your house, you'll actually get a rebate because they are such amazing pumps. So here it is. So this is the Zoller pump and this is the 110 volt grid, grid tied pump right here. It's actually got a vortex pump on it, which means that it's a centrifugal pump that uh, where the rotor actually sits um, independent of the inlet and outlet so that if you do end up having any debris go through the pump, it's not gonna get caught up in the rotor. That's what a vortex pump is. Apparently this is the best switch on the market. So you can hear it switching here. And it only actually will pump out about seven and a quarter inches of water. I measured it with a tape measure. Uh, whereas some sump pumps have these massive uh, wires with float switches that float up and down. This one has a standard kind of stationary float right here. The reason that this is a little bit better than the wire based ones or the floating float switches is that those floating float switches in several occasions have actually got tangled up and then they stop working or the pump stays running and it, and it burns out, which is maybe what actually happened to the pumps in there because I've noticed that they've stopped operating, luckily outside of the wet season. So this also has a secondary port right here and another float switch right here. There's the, there's the click right there. So this is the secondary pump switch, which then hooks in to this guy right here. So that goes in right there. Okay, and this is a DC pump. So this DC pump is going to be a little bit smaller, so it's not gonna have quite the capacity. And it's going to be hooked up to a deep cycle battery over here. And this will give anywhere from six to 10 hours of pumping capacity. It's got a little microprocessor on there so that it can keep the thing properly charged. And so that gives us our second level of redundancy. Now something to notice about all these pumps, they all have integrated check valves, so they won't back flood each other. So when this pump is running, if the 12 volt DC pump over here is not running, it's not gonna end up running water out over here. So it's a pretty smart design. This guy up here is going to be taken off and then it gets plumbed into the uh, pipe that goes outside and uh, and that's how she works. So I'm gonna, next I'm gonna take out all the pumps down in the hole here. I can't really see it all that great, but this is a 50 gallon drum that's tied into all the weeping tile. And I'm gonna take the pumps out of there and then I'm going to replace it with these guys right here. So hopefully you found that interesting. Um, I'll make sure that I put a link to this Zoller pump down below. It comes in two variants, a third horse and a half horse. This third horse can push up to 35 gallons per minute at 10 feet of head. Um, there's some great pump curves online that you can take a look at to see how effective it's gonna be for your particular application. If you're looking for a sump pump, I highly recommend this one. It's not an affiliate or anything. I get no money for recommending it. Um, I just get a lot of questions about sump pumps because people don't really know what to go for. These ones are typically only available at plumbing supply stores, so you won't find this at Home Depot or Lowe's or any of those stores. Um, what makes it a little different is it's cast iron, so it's a little bit more robust. Um, one thing you want to think about when you're installing this and operating it is that you want to make sure that the pump is cycled on a semi-regular basis. So. If, like me, uh, your groundwater kind of dries up or freezes in the wintertime and the pump can sit idle for up to six months, every month or so you want to come down and you want to put some water into the barrel and cycle the pump a couple of times. It's just really good to keep everything moving. Pumps and motors don't really like sitting idle for long periods of time, so it's good to exercise them. Um, and so just one more little thing that you can see on my system here. So we've got our well water right beside our actual sump pump, which is smart because if any of these systems on the well actually break, it will drain first into the sump right here. But we've got this little hose bib right here, which we can turn on. And when we turn our hose bib on, it will allow us to cycle water into the system, which will allow me to exercise the pump. If you found this interesting and helpful, make sure you hit the like button below. It helps the channel to track. 
If you want more of these types of videos, make sure you hit the subscribe. And if you've got a specific type of video that you want me to produce, make sure you leave it in the comment section below. I'd love to produce it for you. I'm always looking for new content, um, anything to do with permaculture, resilient homes, acreages and farms, um, anything mechanical related as it pertains to that. Um, just let me know, put it in the comments. Thanks everyone, have a great day and we'll see you in the next video.